Arguably, Glenn Campbell's best song. Uh, Glenn, uh, no, I, I stand by Wichita Lineman now as the greatest Glenn Campbell song, um, only for the reason that Homer Simpson uh, turns it into even better gold. Oh, okay, and you still think that Shook One's part two is not that great. Uh, anyway, welcome back to <laughs> welcome back to Like 500 Stones, episode number 13. Uh, we are more than halfway there now. We are just cracking into the top 200 songs of all time. And this week, we brought back Caleb Coho as he's about to bite into a sandwich. I figured it's only fair that if uh, Brooklyn is going to play guitar and sing, uh, I will eat a sandwich uh, in fair trade. <laughs> Jimmy Jans. What, uh, is on that, what is on that sandwich for our audio listeners? It is a turkey, cheese, and pickle sandwich. That's fair. All right, but uh, Coho, you've been on the show before. Mm-hmm. Uh, the last episode you were on was one of my favorite episodes. Uh, we sent a lot of hate mail to one Caleb Boatman that episode. Uh, uh, Caleb Boatman has received so much hate mail, both from this show and the good people at Twitter who are mad about his return. Yeah, to <laughs> yeah. Wow. what the fuck? Uh, poor <laughs> Caleb Boatman, he, he broke the number one rule of Twitter. Which is uh, never respond in the comments. Always quote tweet. You always quote tweet your opinion. Always. Uh, never, never, ever, ever, uh, ever uh, go in the comments. Good to know. I'm still not getting a Twitter. But with that, we're going to get right into this list. Uh, we left off last episode with number 201 uh, with uh, Johnny Cash's Ring of Fire. Uh, Coho, do you have any thoughts on this song whatsoever? I love Ring of Fire. Classic. Uh, it's a great Johnny Cash song. I uh, dig it a lot. Um, yeah. Uh, this is probably a good placement right about here. Fair enough. All right. So, with that, we're going to go into number 200. If my computer will load. Oh, classic. Like 500 stones conundrum. <laughs> All right. Number 200 is Changes by David Bowie. Uh, I'll start with this one. I... I really like the song a lot. I think 200 is actually a really, really good spot for it. And I think the thing that works about this song best is the structure of the song. Just like the, the way that it's created, like the, just like each section being its own thing and just creating this really fantastic sonic soundscape. Um, and of course, David Bowie sounds great. Lyrically, it's amazing. I, I think it's a great song. And I think this is a really good spot for it. Brooklyn. Uh, yeah, no, I agree with you when, when you mentioned the structure. I think it does a really good job with like the tension, like they get the do 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 do, and then it cuts right back down, like do do, and then you have that like then you have the piano coming in. So it's a kind of mix of like the Philly soul, like the Philly soul that we were talking about last week with Young Americans, but then like you have that piano and you get more of like the thin white Duke ish elements. Uh, also, this is in Shrek. This is in Shrek Two, the best of the Shrek. So agreed. Come on. Yeah, that's what I was literally about to say. The first time I heard this was in Shrek 2. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, David Bowie's not an artist who usually works for me. This one's fine. Um, so There's like two or three David Bowie's period that I'm like, yeah, this is like good. I enjoy it. Uh, there's like none that I really like love, but it's good. Fair enough. Yeah, a uh, simple song. Great song. Moving on to number 199, Dream On by Aerosmith. Coho, what about you? What do you think? A great song. Um, I think this is probably about the right spot, maybe a little bit lower. Um, but I think it's super fun. Um, I think uh, this is like a song that a bunch of different covers have been done over time. One of the most notable ones uh, being on fucking Glee, uh, which is actually one of the best Glee covers of all time, though. Because it's Neil <laughs> Patrick Harris and Matthew and Harris, yeah. Morrison going ham on the duet. Uh, but this yeah. song is it's fantastic. I, I, I'll take this song in just about any form that it comes. Um, 
but yeah, I'll take. Oh, I, I think Stephen Tyler and Aerosmith probably still the best version. But Neil Patrick uh, Harris and Matthew Morrison, very good. Brooklyn. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe in that same Glee episode, they also do a duet of Piano Man. Yes, they do. Um, in the bar, yeah. Um, in a vacuum, this is this doesn't sound like an Aerosmith song, especially for like for what they would do do later on down the road. Um, Joe Perry, I think, is an overrated guitarist in terms of like. Whoa! Like every everyone else, everyone else around him, Eric Clapton being one of them, and a bunch of others. I think there. Are, I, I think honestly, like Tom Hamilton and Joey Kramer are are, are, over, are overlooked members. Uh, Tom Hamilton being the bassist, especially because uh, he just he has so much so much drive in all in all of these songs. Um, it's fine with this being on a list, but I could see this one taking a huge dip uh, next time around. Well, I will say it did dip, uh, but only slightly. Last time it was number one hundred seventy three. Uh, so this has actually aged pretty well uh, in the, uh, you know, the modern atmosphere of today. Um, I really like this song a lot. This is a weird one when it comes to Aerosmith, because if you listen to literally any other album after this one, Steven Tyler sounds incredibly different. Like his, like his thick like voice comes out a lot in songs later on down the line. Um, and it's a lot prettier here in a weird way. This but is probably, I, Oh, sorry. Uh, I was gonna say, this is probably the end of where we're going to see Aerosmith. I'd like to see like walk this way with run DMC, but we're probably, probably not going to, um, if there's a song, if for anybody who hasn't seen it, hasn't like listened to Aerosmith and needs to like kind of check out, um, maybe not necessarily like a single, but like kind of like a kind of like a B track, "Love in an Elevator" is the song that I think I would put in this spot. Oh, it's like Fun DMC. <laughs> <laughs> but yep, all right, moving on. Uh, number one hundred ninety-eight. Perfect time for my uh, for my headphones to cut out. <laughs> yes, it was. Uh, number 198, Sexual Healing by Marvin Gaye. Uh, only the second time we're seeing Marvin Gaye so far on this list. We had um, Let's Get It On back when we had Zach Ford on the show. But Brooklyn, what do you think of this song? Uh, this is be- this is better than than Let's Get It On, and I think it's just the uh, I think it's the like the rhythm section, and like you have like the like the bait like the bass, and then like the not necessarily like the it's not the cowbell, but it's usually like in, like in a drum kit. There's like the snare, there's the hi hat. Sometimes sometimes they'll have like a block right there. It doesn't really have like a noise, but I think it's I think it's just that. Um, and then yeah, uh, this got sampled uh, pretty heavily. I think a couple of years ago, one of the top forty tracks. And I think Coho will probably help me out on that one. But um, no, this is cool. Uh, Coho, can you help him out with that one? I'm sorry. What year did you say the pop song that you inspired it was? It's, it was like a couple. It was a couple of years ago. I know they like it was. It was a, a, a cover slash like ninety. Uh, everyone sample. covers everything these days and like remakes it. Like there's what's the whatever the one is the I love you baby. They made like a surf like redux of it. It was actually kind of chill. Um, this song's fine. I think like this song gets like blown really high in the history of music because of the drum machine. Um, because the drum machine was like first used in a pop hit like year. Um, it's good. I like Marvin Gaye generally. Um, this one's like fine. Um, I feel like a snob for saying like one of his biggest hits ever is fine. Uh, but like, I don't know. I, I like it. I'm not like, you know, obsessed with it. I really love this song a lot, actually. Uh, <sighs> I probably wouldn't say it's my favorite Marvin Gaye song, but it might be my second one, oh. mainly because of one reason. Sex. Mm. Uh, <laughs> this is the smoothest, sexiest song that Marvin Gaye ever made. Let's get it on. Fine. Great. Sexy. This is perfect. Uh, but it's just got that really great uh, instrumentation section, which is just like smooth and tight and buttery and rich. Oh. How dare you fucking call? Let's get it on fine. Well, I mean, like, no, let's get it on is a great song, but like, when I want, when I want a sexy Marvin Gaye piece, I'm gonna put on sexual healing because his voice is just floating through that instrumentation, and it is so nice. Uh, but before I embarrass myself any further, talking about my personal sex life, number one ninety seven, 
uh, and Peebles, I Can't Stand the Rain. We talked about this a little bit before on episode two, uh, when Missy Elliott's Super Duper Fly is on the list, because that, ham- that samples this song heavily. And I can see why it's become so much more well known. Uh, that instrumentation, that bounce, that groove that it finds, especially when the horns come in, and it sounds like a wooden block. I don't think that's what it is, but definitely, uh, like or, or like a cowbell, something like that. But it creates this really, really great, like sonic landscape. Um, and she just sounds great on here. This is one I think is more about the instrumentation and the groove than it necessarily is about like the lyrics or the, the delivery. But it's really nice. Coho. I've actually never listened to this song. Oh, okay, fair enough. Brooklyn. Yeah, I, I didn't, I, I'm going to be honest. I did not get to do any prep for the show this week. So. <laughs> Fool. I know. Uh, no, this song fucking slaps. Uh, it's, we were talking. We were talking earlier about how because um, this this sort of thing kind of came up came up a couple weeks ago where um, where we had the Fuji's come up with his song and then Roberta Flack came up with the original. And I think this one is much better than Super Duper Fly. Um, ah, so this is the Roberta Flack version in your eyes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna talk. We're gonna talk later. Um, but yeah, I, like the, the the production and the mix. I just like how they kind of like they add in the electric organ, just kind of like as a little bit, a little bit on the top, and then how they're able to kind of pace out the saxophone. They don't really bring it in until the until the pre-chorus. But then you were talking about it earlier, Andrew, how they have that, how they have has that like natural sway, and I think her delivery is delivery as well. Like she kind of trails out in the rain. Um, and then right back down, like bringing back sweet memories. Um, just any female vocalist that can have that low register uh, is incredibly talented. Absolutely. Uh, also, fun fact: first song we're going to talk about this episode that was not on the previous list, and we're going to be on ninety-seven. That's a high debut. Uh, also, get up, sex. Uh, James Brown, get up. I feel like being a sex machine. Koho, what do you think about this song? As you stuck with Sam, yep. <laughs> that was a that was great timing, uh, host. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's fun. It's like I don't have a lot of thoughts on this one. I just think it's I think it's kind of entertaining, but I, I don't. I wouldn't put this on the top five hundred. Fair, uh, Brooklyn. Coho with some wild fucking takes already. Uh, this one's fucking unreal. I just I want to get into it, man. Moving, grooving. Yeah, it's kind of been guys. Bap, 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 get up, bap, 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 up. Um, but just how they do, it's just it's the little. I think it's the little thing, and you can hear like whenever they're recording it, you can hear James just sit like sitting in that groove and fo- and focusing in on when to come in. Um, but I think it's whenever he says like get up, and then in the ba- in the bass line in particular, there is like. There's a there's an eighth note, a rest, and then two and the two more eighth notes, and it just it creates that kind of it creates that kind of like delay delay or the kind of like kind of the swing the swing that you feel. Um, but yeah, this I'd love to see this one live, and I feel like I don't think you're gonna get the chance to do that for a while. No, but like but like obviously like like it'd have to be like a James like a James Brown tri- tribute or something. Um, but just like just the energy that he has in this, and, and they're like, let's get to the bridge. Yeah, let's get to the bridge. Get to the bridge. Yeah, let's get to the bridge. Um, yeah, no, this is fun. Uh, I I highly enjoy this song. I, I it goes on a little bit too long for me um, because it, it does kind of like keep repeating the same like instrumentation a little bit. Um, but I do love the energy and the pocket that James Brown is able to cradle himself in and the, uh, and the rhythm. It really is a really tight, groovy song. Like he's, he's like the godfather for a reason. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's cool. I think last time it was on the list, it was actually at three thirty four, which I think may have been a better spot for it, honestly. Oh man, you guys are you guys are in full you guys are in full force today of uh, just yikes. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it doesn't deserve to be on the list. I absolutely do. I just but... like I like yeah. I just I feel like this. I feel like that song could even go higher. 
Wow, okay. Um, you know what I think, Brooklyn? I think that you're crazy. <laughs> uh, by Patsy Klein. Um, I'm going to have Coho start with this one because I don't know if he knows this one. Uh, that's fine. Huh. That's fine. <laughs> I, okay. I, I like I, I told you when you like brought me on your list like it's like there's like six of these that I can like talk about because I like have feelings. Most of these are like this this is fine. I again I don't know if I put this in my top five hundred or in the top five hundred songs ever made, but like it's I can't begrudge them. It's not like they put a it's not like they put a fucking Cardi B song in, in here like really. not in this section at least. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um I'll go up next on this one. Uh, I really love this song a lot. I think Patsy Klein is one of those people that if you are in the know when it comes to country music, you really love and appreciate. But unless you're in that kind of niche, she's not really as well known as she used to be, which is kind of sad because she has this incredibly fantastic voice that has like just enough smokiness to add a lot of color to her voice. And she always had like these almost bluesy, a little bit jazzy uh, kind of swing to um, her instrumentation. And this has just got that really nice country blues feel to it. Um, but it's also incredibly sweet and incredibly romantic. And it really is sonically uh, a really warm, inviting, welcoming song. It's incredibly romantic, and I'm really happy that it didn't dip too far from where it was last time. Um, but yeah, I think this is one that more people need to check out. Check out more Patsy Klein, folks. Brooklyn. Uh, no, I completely agree. Patsy Klein should be someone that's checked out. I love the like like the loungy sort of sultry feel. It's in six eight, so you kind of have so you have that natural kind of sway. Um, this is this is what Anne Murray dreams to be, but we'll never but we'll never get there. Just like the like the crazy just how do 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 do. Um, I just love that delivery. Like I like I almost would love to see this in like in like Wally or in, in like and then and just kind of have that con like that have that contrast to it because uh, I think it could work really well. Absolutely. Uh, and with that, we're going to move on to number 194, that being Rid of Me by PJ Harvey. Uh, Brooklyn, how about you start us off with this one? Uh, of the songs that we're talking about today, this is the one that I hard skipped. Uh, just not it's not fun. Like it's there's nothing nothing interesting here. Nothing really nothing really new to talk talk about. Um, if there's anything lyric wise, it, it it takes it takes a while to takes a while to get there, but um, no, uh, probably the worst song that we're talking about today. Um, of the songs that we've talked about so far, I would agree with you. However, it took me a while to come around on this song. And when I kind of realized that this, the main intention of this song is to shock, it clicked. I totally understood the instrumentation. I totally understood the lyrics of, I can't remember the one line, but it's, it's like lick my legs of my desire or something like that. It, it genuinely created to make you feel uncomfortable. And the moment I realized that that's what the intention of the song was, it automatically clicked for me. And I actually really dig the hell out of the song a lot more now. Now, do I believe it should be at 194 on this list? Absolutely not. But I understand why it's here now. Coho. This is the pick that some uh, intern at the Rolling Stones <laughs> who's friends with the person just slid onto the editor's desk and said, hey, this is actually some real deep shit. You see that cover art? Fucking about something, bro. And he didn't listen to it. He just said, sure, 194, I need a spot. Uh, it's fine. It's whatever. I think it's actually kind of trash, uh, personally. But like, I it's, eh, like it's one of those where I was like, I really would not put this on the top five hundred. But I also just like, I it, it's hard for me to be like, oh, it's not for me, so it shouldn't be on the top five hundred. But that's exactly what I'm gonna say. It's not for me, so it shouldn't be on the top five hundred because uh, this top five hundred should cater exclusively to me, really stuff. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, this is why the next list is being strictly made by strictly Caleb Coho. 
so would number 193 Wild Horses by the Rolling Stones make that list, Coho? That's textbook pandering. <laughs> um, your website's called Rolling Stone. So there's going to be a lot of Rolling Stones. I think this is only the second time we've brought them up, actually. Uh, yeah, I think so. Well, uh, what was the one before this? Painted this Black. Yes. This is higher than Painted Black? Yes, it is. Bullshit. I'm sorry. <laughs> Painted Black is probably the one of two Rolling Stone songs I would accept entirely to be in the top 500. This song, absolutely not. Um, putting this higher than Painted Black actually enrages me even more. Because I think Painted Black is, like, by a wide margin, the best song the Rolling Stones have ever made. Um, fuck. That actually just totally dampered the hell out of my opinion on this song. Wow, <laughs> fuck this song. Get it out of here. <laughs> um, I I think I like this song. I, I like the song a lot. Um, it, it does have a very nice tenderness to it that the Stones don't normally show off in a lot of their more well-known songs. Um, and that line, Wild Horses Couldn't Drag Me Away, it really is a very thoughtful, poetic line uh, with a lot of emotional weight to it. Uh, I I really like this song a lot, but there's like a bunch of other Rolling Stones songs that I would put above this. Um, I want to, hopefully we'll see something like Gimme Shelter or 19th Nervous Breakdown, or you can't always get what you want higher up than this, uh, Brooklyn. Uh, this is this is fine. I agree with Coho that Paint of Black, like Paint of Black and Wild Horses, horses should probably switch here. Um, what I like about this song, and I think what people are, what musicians, I guess, are going to gravitate to, is how it creates tension in the verses and how it, like, how it doesn't use like the root, the root note of this. So whenever you're going into every, every line, like you're you're getting that, getting that B minor, and it and it fit and it fits fits with it, but you just you kind of want it, you want to hear like that root in order. To, that root G to kind of kind of like resolve everything, and then you finally get that in the chorus. Um, what I really like, and I think it would kind of become a lot popular uh, down the road. Like John Mellencamp would really do it, um, and like whenever you would play, like when you're playing songs in like G, and then you're throwing in that throwing in that weird F, uh, it just it sounds just enough off, and it and it makes sense. But if we're talking about Rolling Stone songs that need to be up here next, there's only one other one that should be there, and it's Miss You. You're you're insane. You're fucking Miss you, nuts. Miss you is the greatest Rolling Stone song ever. Uh, because it's, okay. it's a fucking jam. Okay, before I rip Brooklyn's head off, and we're gonna go on to number one ninety two. Uh, mind playing tricks on me by the Ghetto Boys. I feel like my mind's playing tricks on me, thinking that we just said Miss You is the best Rolling Stone song. Um, Brooklyn, how about you start us off with this one? Uh, this is uh, this is much better than the raps or uh, yeah than the rap song that we talked talked about last week. Uh, love. Oh the- my God, Brooklyn! Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Again. What did you talk about last week? Shook uh, one shark two by Mob Deep. No, he's right. And we also talked about Stan. Not better than Stan, but you're right on the. No, phone, it is not better than Stan. Oh uh, get get Mar- 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 is going to kill one of you. Uh, Ghetto Boys, Ghetto Boys is cool though. I don't know, I don't know a, a lot about them, but the beat, about the beat in this is, is really cool. Uh, they have a lot of, they have a lot of really good delivery. Um, I think for this one in particular, it's kind of like it's just right in the middle of like Chuck D and Ice Cube, where you have like that raw, but then you have that also like pastor on the pastor on the soapbox kind of kind of delivery. Yeah, I think that this song, um, it sounds great. I, I want to say it's the Isley Brothers that they sample in this. Um, cause that instrumentation is so great with like the, the shimmery, gleamy guitar offsetting the really dark, like paranoia in the lyrics that these guys create. Uh, each one of them has like their own kind of sound to their voice, but each one of them like works off the other one, like so perfectly in that way. And as I said, I think the lyrics are what really make the song stand out. The sense of paranoia, whether it just be from being in a gang or, you know, just looking over your shoulder over like the bad things you've done in your past, or just literally your mind deteriorating. It just creates this haunting atmosphere and this really dark world that these three live in. Uh, and I think that this is a great song and I think that this is a perfect spot for this. Koho, what do you think? Mint, 
good song. I enjoy it. I would not put it in the top 200, but I get it. Um, decent. Fair enough. All right, let's move on to number 191. Ode to Billy Joe by Bobby Gentry. Uh, I'm going to have Coho start with this one. Can't hear you. Oh, fuck. Nope, still can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Is this song about a cucumber that wears a, uh, uh, a cowboy hat? I will slap. Are you trying to uh, call her? Are there, boy, are there a boy essentials? band called Boys in the Sink? I will slap the sandwich out of your and goddamn it's stomach. Fine. Uh, it's fine. It's fine. It's not Phil Vischer and Mike Naraki's seminal classic, The Ballad of Billy Joe, uh, starring Mike Naraki as the seminal character, Larry the Cucumber. However, um, it's, uh, it's fine. It's not bad. Uh, I'm not... I'm not like this genre's biggest supporter. So, Brooklyn, I appreciate this song. I think the song is aged quite aged quite well, and I appreciate I appreciate the unorthodox, I guess, mixing and like kind of like how how they were structuring it with like the like the strings and then that almost like gypsy esque kind of uh, kind of guitar. Um, but yeah, I'm, this is one I'm glad, like, I'm, I'm excited to kind of, kind of check out and kind of keep, keep in the, uh, keep in the back burner. So let me tell you this much real quick. Last time on the list, this was 419. This has apparently aged really well in the popular conscious. And I'm so glad it has. I fucking love this song. I think that the greatest aspect of this song is easily Bobby Gentry's lyrics. Because you get that, you know, that kind of at-home atmosphere at the beginning and the first verse. And then at the end of the first verse, you hear uh, Billy Joe McAllister jumped off the Tallahatchie Bridge. And it immediately changed the tone of the song on a dime. And then later on, you hear the mom talking about how he, how she heard from the preacher's boy that she, that he saw her and Billy Joe tossing something off that same bridge a few days ago. Once again, immediately changing the tone of the song. Because now you not only want to know why Billy Joe jumped off the bridge, but what she and the narrator were doing on the bridge a few days ago, creating this almost fantastic kind of mystery in this song. And the other thing I love about it is just that cello, that cello that comes in every once in a while, just with that one simple stroke, just creating this incredible sound. I personally think that this is one of my favorite songs I've like discovered in the last five years. I love this song. I get why people don't right now, but man, I think it is a lyrical masterpiece. Can't wait to find out that they dropped uh... They dropped the entire DC Cinematic Universe off a of bridge. That's why. It, <laughs> that, that's that, that, that's what happened. Zack Snyder's corpse over the side of a bridge. That's what happened. Fucking yikes. <laughs> uh, all right, let's move on to number 190. Uh, Fuck the Police by NWA. All I can hear is that John Mulaney bit. Fuck yeah. the Duh. Police. And this then is the uh, perfect the panel come of in people. My friend throws a whiskey bottle down. Scatter! <laughs> this is this is the perfect panel of people to talk about NWA. <laughs> Absolutely, especially this song. Why don't yeah. you start us off, Coho? Oh, this is a masterpiece. Um, I think NWA is one of the best rap groups ever, if not maybe the best rap group ever. Um, I'm a big NWA fan. Um, I really like this one. This is just like a really like not even not even to talk about the like politics of the song, just to, for a minute, just to talk about the actual song. It's one of the most like get you like riled up songs ever. Like, just gets you, like, ready to go. You can fight someone. Um, this is on my walking playlist, to be totally honest with you. When I walk around, I have this song. Like, when I'm, when I'm trying to exercise, I put this song on because it's just like, boom, I'm ready to go. Uh, I just want to see like, Caleb Coho power walking, mouthing the words to the police, the police by the, as he walks by the elementary school. <laughs> no, it's more like walking past the police station, just screaming the chorus, like, oh, shit. Uh, no, um, but 
this song is great. I think like you can't talk about like you can't talk about the song without talking about the politics of the time and the song's inspirations. And I think it's like a perfectly valid response to what was going on in LA with the LAPD. And I think it's honestly a perfect time capsule. Um, that's still timeless. Like that's the weird thing is it's simultaneously a perfect time capsule of the late eighties, early nineties in LA, the Rodney King and all that era. Um, even this, even though this predates Rodney King, um, just covering the end of Reaganism in LA and the beginning of through, through the Bush administration and into Rodney King and all that. I think that's like a perfect time capsule of what it was like in, in that period of time. But it also extends far outside that to the point where you like, can like listen to the song today and what they are saying in it and the sentiments felt behind it. And you still feel those sentiments today. Um, and I think that's, what's huge. Uh, I think MC Ren and Ice Cube are like two like really, really, really undervalued writers in hip hop. I think Ice Cube has like found his like his historical place where people are like, oh yeah, Ice Cube. But like MC Ren does not get enough credit for writing as many NWA bangers as he has. Um, but definitely, definitely one of the best from NWA. Um, I don't know if it's my personal favorite. I think it definitely belongs in the top 500 songs of all time. I don't know if I put it in the top 200, but I definitely believe it, it deserves a place here. Yeah, uh, I actually kind of want to agree with you. Uh, I think MC Ren is one of the most underappreciated rappers, like, ever. Like, the dude was sharp with a pen, but he was also sharp with his delivery. And um, the other... Ice Cube is also really great on the song. Honestly, I I don't think E's verse on this was is that good. I think he's easily the weakest of the three on this particular song. Um, but I still think that the song overall is great. I think the beat really helps with this especially that siren that blares through every once in a while and i think the thing that actually really really helps the song a lot is like this the the skits that come throughout the way that it's framed as like them putting this cop on trial uh it's just really smart it's one of those songs that it's one of the it's one of the few very rare times I hate the fact that it's aged as well as it has yeah. because you're right. It is just as important now as it was back then, even more so probably up today. Cause when you think about the fact that last time the list was out back in 2012, this song was actually at 424. Ooh. Yeah. It's aged so well that it's skyrocketed up this list. And once again, it's one of those situations where I hate saying that, but it's very true. Brooklyn. Uh, yeah, no, this is, this is our, I think this is the objectively like best song from that, from that record. Um, I agree with you, Andrew, and that easy ease first is not the, not the greatest. He just, he doesn't have that, like he doesn't have that swagger and that flow that he does in like uh straight out of Compton or uh cruising down in my, cruising down in my, in my six, four. Um, if I am going to nip, if I'm going to get a little more nitpicky, um, if we're talking about this, if we're talking about the but the rec like the record from start to finish, this is a great this is a great beat by Do Dr. Dre. But out of that, taking it as an individual song, this is not one of Dr. Dre's better ones. Just because it's I think it steals a lot from from Straight Outta Compton, and especially like in the chorus and when it's just like oh fuck the police, fuck 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 the police. Like you, you, I think there is something there to to, to uh, like you could do something a little bit different with it. But I understand like uh, as a as like a record from like start to finish that that it's that it's that it's great in that sense. Uh, but yeah, I. Um, I also agree in that like MC, like MC Ren is uh like his his verse is really good Ice Cube Ice Cubes is good in this um and then yeah like at that at the end it's like it's I want justice fuck you you motherfucker it's so it's, great because the way that he like pronunciates that makes yeah. you understand that he's just like the whitest most uptight person ever mm -hmm. you you motherfuckers uh, uh and that is why they cast Paul Giamatti in Straight Outta Compton. Yeah, pr pr pretty much. Uh, he could do the imitation 100%. So. <laughs> uh, moving on to number 189, Space Oddity by David Bowie. Uh, back to Bowie on this one. Uh, Brooklyn, start us off. 
Uh, probably the best song for the shed, I would say. Uh, just the one, <laughs> just the one, one guitar. Uh, ground control to me, it's all. Um, but yeah, uh, just middle, middle of the road. Like this, like David Bowie has kind of been kind of spiked in the last, uh, in the last couple weeks. Um, if there's one other song, like I, I, I'm not excited about this one. If if dance was here, I'd be like, fuck yeah, because that's another it's another aspect of Bowie uh, to kind of appreciate. But I feel like with this, we kind of got that already with the like, Young Americans and changes, the kind of that acoustics, acoustic side. Yeah, um, I actually really like the song. This is the song that I actually got introduced to David Bowie with, um, mainly because I think people were like. Andrew's a theatrical person. This is a very theatrical song. Uh, yeah, no, this song is great. I, I just love the the storytelling aspect that the lyrics create, bouncing back and forth between Ground Control and Major Tom. Um, and even just like the, the 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 whole celebrity aspect of being an astronaut at that time, where they're like, they want to know what clothes you wear. And I think the thing that I really like really picked up the last time is how great the percussion on this song is the hi-hat in particular it's so so nice it's crispy it just really creates this excellent sound um yeah it's otherworldly <laughs> coho this is david bowie's second best song no yeah. it's a great song um i think his writing on it is fantastic um i think the way he tells the story it makes you care about someone who you don't even know the name of in the entire round of this and like, but, well, I guess major Tom, but like, I guess like you don't know a lot about him. You don't know a lot about anyone involved. It's just a situation where you just sit there and you're just like, man, I, this person's dying and you yeah. can't do anything about it. And that's just like a really fucked up song. Uh, but it's also like, <laughs> it's fucked up. That this it's really like, fucked up. It really is. Five minutes of this guy dying and makes you care. And then, like, yeah, I don't know. I think this is actually, like, a really well-done song. I absolutely would put it in the top 500. I think that this and, and Heroes are David Bowie's best two songs by a lot. And uh, I'm glad they recognize this one. Fair. Uh, question for you. Where do you think this was on the last time that they released this list? I'm going to guess it's gone down. I'm going to guess this was, like, in the top 100. I'm going to guess I'm gonna guess it's climbed up a little bit. I'd say it's, like, three, 333. Wasn't even on the list last time. Oh, wow. Oh. How? Yeah, I this had a triple is, check that. This is the one that you throw on here, though? But, like, we... Yes! I, I, that doesn't... No, but it doesn't, like, it doesn't make sense. To, I, I think... I think having this song and Rocket Man, it's it's redundant, though. But but this list is, again... is It's... You're redundant. You know what's redundant? You know what? That's like saying... That's like saying having West Side Story from 1961... And La La Land on a list is redundant because they're both musicals. Even if they're <laughs> not there. That, that's a really weird choice. But they're but they're both like but they're both like spacey spacey sort of sort of vibes and anyways. Frozen yogurt and ice cream are just the same thing. No, that's they're all not. Get the, they are, get the they, are but they are, but <laughs> moving on before we start throwing things at each other. Yogurt uh, is number... a probiotic culture. <laughs> <laughs> number 188. Little Wing by the Jimi Hendrix Experience. Um, I'll start with this one because this song is this song is like the '60s version of a vibe. It like there's not a lot to it other than the instrumentation and a few really well crafted like poetic lyrics, but it's relatively short. And it really, really is benefited by that triangle that comes in every once in a while. That triangle just adds that little, like, extra touch of atmosphere and mood to it. Plus, I mean, just Jimi Hendrix being one of the greatest guitarists ever and honestly probably being the greatest, the only person who could ever play with their teeth and actually make it sound good. Um, but yeah, the the experience and the the atmosphere that they create with this song really really is heavenly brooklyn 
All right, I'm gonna push up my glasses here for a second and oh, no. actually you. It's not a try. It's not a triangle. It's a it is a xylophone just because they have like oh, have, okay. like the, have like the the different notes or whatever. But you're absolutely right though. This is everything that I love about the fucking sixties. Um, and like Jimmy's del- Jimmy's delivery on this, like where he ha- where he kind of lets that low note sort of strum, and then and then kind of ha- then has the lick lick around that, and then you have that bass note sort of lingering there. Um, also the way that the rest of the band comes in. Uh, um and just uh that space that spacious sort of vibe but i would have loved to be a fly in the wall in that room and like whenever they're doing that intro and they're like you know what it really you know what to make this better xylophones and it's just that right amount of contrast <laughs> jimmy jimmy i know you're a fucking genius but let me give you a word of advice xylophone no, I, I'd say I'd say Jimmy. I got I'd say Jimmy away is for five the seconds. I got up and walked away for five seconds to grab a water. I sit down. The only thing I hear is xylophones. <laughs> I think it's more xylophones. So I was like, the fuck? "What the fuck are we talking about?" Twinkle, twinkle, little star made it at one eighty-eight. Like, what? The fuck? Oh, go ahead, Coho. Uh, that song's fine. Uh, I like it. It's, it's decent. You're right. It's a vibe. It's a mood, but I wouldn't put it in the top 500. I mean, Jimi Hendrix is like the greatest guitarist to ever live, so I can't be mad that he's here. But okay, fair enough. It's a very simple song. Not much to talk about on that one, but I still think it's great. Uh, as opposed to number 187, uh, "Subterranean Homesick Blues" by Bob Dylan, I'm going to start with this one by saying, "Why is this here? Why is this this high?" I look. I really like Bob Dylan. I like Bob Dylan a lot. And this is one of those songs that everyone kind of, that that people who don't know Bob Dylan kind of assume that he is. And I, I don't hate this song, but I, this is not one of Bob Dylan's best. And it's not one of the 500 best in my opinion, because I don't know what kind of campfire, like, look, we're going to sing a really fast song on my, on the uh, acoustic guitar. Like, I don't know what this is. Like, I don't think that this is one of... I, what, what is doing here? Coho. Hey, my name's Bob Dylan. I sound like a nailed a kazoo up my nose. Um, I'm not a I'm not a big Bob Dylan guy. Uh, I like some of it. I don't love all of it, which is sacrilege. He's from my home state. Uh, but, eh, this shouldn't be here. There's not a lot of Bob Dylan I would say deserves to be in the top 500. There's a couple. I'll give you like the times are changing. They, they, that's like Bob Dylan's best song. Um, but you just like that because of Watchmen. Fuck you. Don't expose me like that. Fuck you. <laughs> expose him. Expose him. Desolation Row, except the MCR covers better. Okay. 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 It is. Okay. It is. Brooklyn. I was getting this right right now. I mean, if we're talking about Bob, Bob Dylan songs, don't think twice. It, it's all right. I think it's I think it's his best. But I fucking love. I, I love this. I I think I think this is the like the peak chaotic good that you can get of Bob Dylan. And then like the lyrics of like um he wants eleven dollar he wants eleven dollar bills, but you only got ten. And it's just like man, doesn't that suck? But let's have like let's have a have a great fucking time. Um yeah. And, oh yeah, sorry. Two other things. One, this is um, the the music video of this is what Weird Al uh, ended up parodying with Bob, that palindromic sort of deal. Um, and my question, I guess, for either of you guys, where does the video, where's it, where does the music video rank? I'd say over under on like top one hundred. Uh, with for, for this song, for this song, this is the one where he has like the signs and he's putting. Yeah, no, I know which one down. you're talking about. Oh. Uh, I would put it at number two sixty four. I would put it at number not on the top 500. Nope. No. no. Uh, moving along. There's 100 Michael Jackson music videos that deserve to be here before that one. <laughs> and they're all different versions of Thriller. And they're all <laughs> Thriller. <laughs> uh, number 186, I'll Take You There by the Staple Singers. Uh, Coho, any thoughts on this one? I have no thoughts on this one, Cotton. I think I heard a little bit of it, and then I was like, yeah, all right. This is definitely a song I think you've definitely heard before, but don't know what it is. Yeah, it's fine. It's I. <laughs> oh, uh, just come back to me for a second. I need to remember which song this is. <laughs> okay. Uh, I guess I'll go then. Um, uh, I'll save you the time, Brooklyn. It doesn't have Bob Dylan going. Oh, okay. Hey, sorry. Hey, yeah. hey. No, I'm. I know. I'm good now. Uh, yeah. This is this is fine. Um, I like if this came up. 
this kind of came up in a soundtrack in a movie. But like, oh yeah, this is cool. Uh, I could see this coming in in like Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three. But, yeah, I can I see can, that because yeah. I think the the strength of this song is the groove. I think the groove that that bass creates uh, really is tight and immediately memorable. And like the moment you hear that, you go, oh, okay, I know what song this is. Um, see, because I don't want to take away from the staple singer because they really are incredible vocalists, especially, uh, especially Mavis Staples. Um, watch Summer of Soul if you haven't seen it. The documentary, it's so good. Um, but I don't... Yeah, pretty good. This song is okay. It's good. Um, last time it was on here, it was actually at 281. So it's it, it's climbed. And I don't really understand why. Maybe because it's been sampled a lot. Um, but I don't want, once again, I don't want to take away from the staple singers because they are great. But this one is just not for me, I would get, I guess I would say. Respect, but not for me. Oh, look at that. Uh, Moving on to 185, uh, Beat It by Michael Jackson. We will save one particular person on this panel for last. Uh, Brooklyn, how about you start? Uh, this is this is cool, but if there's anything that's kind of kind of confusing, and especially with like how how music will kind of handle these situations later on. Eddie Van Halen needs to be featured on this because it, it's not just because I think initially it was like, oh, he's brought on, he's brought on for the solo. He's not just brought on for the solo. Like it, like you can you can hear his influence throughout the entirety of it, and it feels more so of a collaboration. It's incredible. I fucking love this. Like this is this is easily top. This is easily top five Michael Jackson. Um, this is one eighty five. I think is the, is the right spot for it. Um, but yeah. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, <Okay. laughs> I, I would, I would be willing to say top 10 Michael Jackson songs. Um, cause you're right. That Eddie Van Halen guitar riff really is the, uh, the driving force of this song. Uh, and it's just instantly memorable. Like you hear you even hear the beginning just of that bell and you automatically know what song this is, but the drive, the propulsion, the energy of this song is real killer. Uh, Michael Jackson is absolutely giving one of his best performances on this song. Just the way that he throws himself into the lyrics, the instrumentation. Yeah. The groove of this song is so great. And the energy, I, I agree. I think this is a really good spot for it. It could be higher in my opinion. Um, but let's talk to the one who, uh, I know loves Michael Jackson more than the two of us. I actually really want to do a project where like, I listen to every Michael Jackson song in a row and rank them and make a comprehensive ranking of every Michael Jackson song. Um, I might do that. That might be my, that might be my summer project. Um, uh, all but, songs while he was alive or including posthumous. Oh, I'd include escape and Michael. But I would cut the one Michael song that is very clearly not Michael Jackson singing the Michael Jackson song. Fair. There's one song on Michael that, like, if you listen to it, you're like, oh, God, yeah, that is not Michael Jackson singing that song. They got, like, someone who sounds like Michael Jackson, but it's not Michael Jackson. Um, It's very gross. That's why Michael is his worst album. Follow me for more uh, Michael Jackson uh, conversation. Uh, but Beat It is, Beat it is very good. Uh, I would not put it in the top ten Michael Jackson songs, but, like, I get it. Um... For the for like the for like a list like this, where it's like yeah, we're obviously going to take probably the most popular Michael Jackson songs and put them on the top five hundred. I could accept it. It's a good song. It's a lot of fun. I think the music video is fantastic. Um, I think like all through and through, it's it's a great song. Michael Jackson only makes bangers. Uh, but I would not, I would not put this one. If I put this in the top five hundred, it would have been probably three hundred spots lower. Um, and it would be amongst like a lot of other, like, are there are a lot of other Michael Jackson songs I could put here in this spot. I could put like, leave me alone in this spot. I could put like, who is Yo, it? Leave me spot. alone. So good. I could put, who is it in this spot? There are Michael Jackson songs I think deserve to be this high on the list that probably aren't even on the top 500. Uh, but we put Cardi B and Megan the stallion, uh, and Lil Nas X as much as I love Lil Nas X. That's a little early. Uh, but, um, Michael Jackson's beat it. Very worthy inclusion. I think it's a phenomenally done song. The rock elements of it are something that he he doesn't do often and never again like this. Um, 
there's a reason he won a rock Grammy for this song on an album that is a pop album. There's a, if you want to know why Michael Jackson holds the records for most Grammys one in one in a single night, it's because he made an album that has like six different genres on it. And the Grammys went, Oh yeah. Okay. There's pop, there's R and B, there's uh rock. Uh, and we're going to nominate it in all the fields and he's going to win every time he's nominated. Uh, so yeah, that's why, but beat it's great. Uh, fantastic one. And uh, the John Mayer cover with all of is pretty fucking rad. <laughs> Okay, it's it's fine. Yeah, it's pretty. Simple. Um, so fun fact: last time on the list, this was number three hundred forty-four. Uh, which huh. I think th- this is the more correct placement for this song. In my, I opinion. mean, by comparison of what else is on this list, yeah, like Michael Jackson should probably have at least seventy-five of the top one hundred. But you know, let's just. Be- and also, this is only the second time that Michael Jackson has come up on What's the list. What's the one that's lower? Uh it was Rock with You. Huh. I, I don't remember where it was. It was I think like, Rock With You is better than Beat It. I want to say it was in the Rock, 300s. I think Rock With You is better than Beat It. I, really? I would, their, I would flip their placements. Um, I Here's my thing. Rock With You is... is it, it, You're comparing two totally different eras of Michael Jackson, where it's like every album... it's Michael Jackson, I would I would argue, invented the era thing in pop everyone's gonna credit it to taylor swift because he was the first one to say it out loud but i would say michael jackson is the first person to have like eras um i agree and, i wouldn't and, even say the beatles actually well the beatles albums don't change drastically enough for me for them to be eras you're so, insane you're high fair but i'm just I, I to me the beatles always are the beatles but michael jackson's albums are like 180 from everything he does every time um speaking of like, 180 I, I I think off like his off the wall era is very like very unique to like oh he did disco and he gave disco the best album on its way out and beat it is on his fucking I'm gonna do everything bullshit grind I I will not accept any more slander of ABBA's Voulez-vous. that is the greatest disco album ever okay well listen off the walls is an underappreciated gem of an album and uh, rock with you is the crowning achievement of that album. So I would, I would, I, I'm I, obviously, I think Thriller's a masterpiece of the best album he's ever made in his best era by a sizable margin. But I, I would say if we're comparing individual records, I take rock with you over beat it. Okay, fair enough. As we move on to number 184. Also, sorry, I'll kill someone. If that's the last time we see Michael Jackson on this list, which we definitely. Fair. fair. I would actually do the exact same thing. Cause there is at least two more songs minimum that I would <laughs> Two, two. You think that's the minimum? <laughs> there should be like thirty more Michael Jackson songs in the top five hundred. Right. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, Greatest. Nothing compares to you by Sinead O'Connor. Uh, number one eighty four, one spot above "Beat It" by Michael Jackson. Brooklyn doesn't deserve to be over Beat It. Uh, no, it doesn't. It does not. It's cool, but this is way too high. Um, I think the well. Sorry, one the music video definitely helped definitely helped this. I think this might be one of the first examples of uh, of a one take, uh, where it's just her, where it's just, just like her head in the frame. Um, also, uh, re listening to this for this show, uh, this is I, I I growing up I didn't wasn't able to kind of connect this as like a Prince song, but this is very much so a very much so a Prince song. Very even, like in, even in the second verse, like how she's delivering how she's delivering some of the lines. Um, yeah, it's cool, but this is this sh- will probably dip. Yeah, I agree with you. This is very much a print song, uh, especially when you listen to the lyrics. Uh, I could have a dinner at a fancy restaurant. Uh, it's been seven hours and fifteen days. These are absolutely Prince lyrics, um, but I do think Sinead O'Connor does a better job with the song. Uh, I think I, I really love this song a lot. I think 150 uh, or um, 184 is a little high, even though it was only 165 last time. So this is just kind of stood still almost. Um, I, I really do love the sincerity of the lyrics and her vocal performance of it. Um, I'm okay with it being on the list, but yeah, it's a little high. Come on. This is part of this random bullshit of uh, Prince versus Michael Jackson. And we, just keep, we keep 
we keep, for some reason, finding that the general populace, the public at large, has declared unanimously that Michael Jackson has won this stupid feud that Prince wanted to start with them. And uh, Rolling Stones continues to take Prince's side without any explanation, which is a futile and stupid gesture. But I'll give Prince more compliment. He sings this better than her. Prince sings this song better. Um, which is kind of crazy because I think Prince is not that great. Um, I think Prince is actually an extremely overrated artist. And a, to an extent, not even an extent, to a bigger extent, a more overrated songwriter than he is a singer. Um, and I think that uh, Nothing Compares to You is fine. It should not be in the top 500. Probably shouldn't even be in the top 1,000. It's not a great song. It's fine. Um, I think that Sinead O'Connor has a different meaning to this than Prince does. And I think that uh, Prince is a hack. And uh, a, good guitar, a good guitarist, a shitty songwriter, and a shitty singer. And he should have no songs in the top 500. Uh, huh. Michael Jackson has won this feud. And that is proven. In that one video where you see Michael Jackson and Prince at a James Brown concert, he brings them up on stage and Michael Jackson sings and dances uh, and Prince plays his guitar and there's a much larger celebration of what Michael Jackson does and Prince throws his guitar and storms off stage because he didn't get as many claps as Michael. Yep. All right, moving on. <laughs> I, I, mean, I, I was going to talk about how she sings it for her mom, but like. I can't. I, I don't know. Where Prince to go is from a there. punk bitch. Moving on. <laughs> okay, before we get stabbed, all three of us. Um, <laughs> number one eighty. Send your hate mail to Caleb Bowman. <laughs> what at, the email at because again? I'm Bowman on Twitter. At because I'm Bowman on Twitter. Yes. <laughs> oh my god, Bowman's gonna kill you. Bcuz um, underscore I'm Bowman. <laughs> Moving on to number 183, uh, you are the sunshine of my life, something that Boatman will not be saying to Coho for a while, uh, by Stevie Wonder. <laughs> um, let's have Coho start with this one. I can't make it, I'm not going to, never mind. Uh, <laughs> I won't say that. Uh, Stevie Wonder's good. This is a decent song. Um, I prefer other Stevie Wonder songs. I don't think, has Superstition come up yet? Nope. Okay, then I'm guessing that's higher. Um, if this is here, then I'm guessing Superstition will be here in a while, and Superstition is, is a great song. This is a fine song. Um, I would not put it in the top 500, uh, but then again, I don't, I wouldn't put a ton of Stevie. There's a lot of Stevie Wonder I'd put on the list, but not this one. Um, we actually talk just about... talked about, uh, Sign Sealed and Delivered I'm Yours on the last episode. Okay. This should not be higher than that. Um, I'll also, I'll also say, have we talked? I don't know if I'm messing people. I know. I see Wonder absolutely did this. Uh, Isn't She Lovely? Has that come up yet? Nope. nope. Oh, that's fucking bullshit. Isn't She Lovely is better than both those songs. All right. Isn't She Lovely is actually yeah, Stevie Wonder's best song. I'm just going to say that right now. Oh, uh, uh, Sir Duke would like to have a word with you. Sir Duke can suck my ass. Brooklyn. <laughs> Uh, sure. Um, I think why this is here is for the intro and just how jazzy, how jazzy it is. It's very, it's like it kind of blends the lines of jazz and R and B. Uh, I this, yeah, this is a, yeah, this is this is a du this is a duet. Uh, I forget, uh, I forget who it, who it is that's uh, that's, that's joining him. Um, but I'm perplexed, I guess, as to as to why as to why it is here for other than that. Um, if even if we're talking like duets, like we like we should probably see Ebony and Ivory um like down the road. Really? Ebony and Ebony Ivory and Ebony, Ebony and I Ebony and Ivory is great. Like they have really good chemistry. Is it though? Is it though? Um so before I let Brooklyn have a chance to speak, um, I mean, I, I'm kind of with Coho on this one. There are better Stevie Wonder songs that could be on this list. And I think I think this is a very romantic song. It's a very soft, it's a very like good song with like the soft instrumentation and the jazzy elements and Stevie Wonder's vocals. And it, it, it sounds very pretty, but he's got better songs. Honestly, like signed, sealed, and delivered. So, sign, sealed, delivered. It's yours. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, as compared to 182, the sounds of silence by Simon and Carfunkel. Um, I'm gonna let Brooklyn go first. Uh, this is an overrated Simon and Garfunkel song. Go fuck yourself. It's just, it's just okay. It is not the boxer. It is not Jeez. America. It is not Mrs. Robinson. 
Um, there are much there. They, they, they do, they do this a lot better. Also, I, I, I know that I'm in, I know that I'm in the minority camp of this, but disturbed does a really good. Go job. fuck yourself. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's fine. Like it just it kind of blends into that like Jefferson airplane kind of like six 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 sixties folk, um, and it that's not what I. Yeah, it's 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 everything that I don't like about Simon and Garfunkel is kind of like is kind of like uh, um, is extended, I guess. Hey Todd, what the fuck? <laughs> um, Coho, go ahead. I. I... This is one of the greatest songs ever written. This is absolutely deserving of its place on this list. Um, Thank you. I think this is a phenomenal song. This is the second best song Simon and Garfunkel have ever made behind the song Mrs. Robinson. Um, but uh, this is great. I will also back you up. The Disturbed Discur- the cover is very good. It's not better than the original, but it's very good. Um, and I think they're doing totally different things. Um, and I think what this one does is they're both there. It's a very haunting song regardless, but I think one is going for a gentle aftermath and one is going for a dark build. Um, and I think that disturbs version is very good for what it's trying to do. Um, I think this is great. This is deserving of its place. I actually think it should go a little bit higher uh, than this spot. I think when you're talking about purely phenomenally written songs, uh, this is probably Paul Simon's best work as a songwriter. Um, I think it's a phenomenally written lyrically song. Um, it's poetry. Um, but I think, uh, I, I prefer Mrs. Robinson just cause it's, it's fun. I think as long as a bop, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, but the sound of silence is, is a masterpiece and should be higher on this list. I'm going to show my cards <clears throat> at the beginning, uh, for the end of the episode. This is in my top 10 favorite songs of all time. I think that this song is a masterpiece. Just the opening guitars just immediately capture that sense of ennui and sadness and just, I don't know where to go with my life, um, kind of sound that they that they really wanted. Um, especially what, like the opening lyric, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend, like immediately you you know what this song is and where it's going. Uh, it, it's just poetically, as Bo, as, um, as Coho said, like uh, just the, the imagery that this song really creates in restless dreams i've walked alone uh and um thoughts like a cancer grow and just like things like that especially the one character that they bring up that almost is like this this like hey listen to me and i can like help you and things like that really creates this incredible atmosphere and this sonic soundscape that starts to slowly build the tempo and increase the heartbeat of the listener. I, I, I'm kind of mad that this is only at 182, but I'm just happy it's on the list, but still, whatever. Question for Andrew, that this or Summer Highland Falls in terms of like better sad songs? Sound of Silence. Sound of Silence. Uh, you, you know me, you know I love Summer Highland Falls, but it's not... Yeah, Summer Highland Falls is my favorite Billy Joel different, song, but like, whoa, 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 let's not be crazy now, Bart. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Like, I'll well, back this up. Is not not wrong. They're not. I don't think it's even really comparable. I think the Sound of Silence is like leaps and bounds better than that one. But I also think like they're just playing in different leagues. One's playing in you know the NFL, the other one's playing in Canada. The USFL. <laughs> uh, I was saying Canada. The but... Canadian Football League. <laughs> Canadian Football League. One of them is playing for the Iowa Barnstormers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Springfield Isotopes. Uh, <laughs> all right. With that, we're going to move on to number 181, Eight Miles High by the Birds. I'm going to let Coho start off with this. Did did bar freeze or referees? Uh, but think bar- I think you froze. Oh, well. Whatever happens. So we're gonna start. With uh, I I'm I kind of like. I'm, okay, I think like the birds are decent. They're like kind of a like we are copying one era of the Beatles, uh, for life. But yeah. they're decent. Like I think they're good at what they're trying to do. They like heard the Beatles do something and said we can do that, and then they do that one thing just as well. Um, and the Beatles went, hey, we're gonna keep not doing that. Um, so, uh, I like turn turn turn. I think is their best song. Um, I think that's by a fair margin the bird's best song ever. Uh, Eight Miles High is good, it's fine. 
Um, I don't mind it being here. I'm not like offended. Um, over the sound of silence is fucking crack. Yep. Um, but it's 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 a decent '60s pop song. I put it like if you're gonna put it in the top 500, I'd put it in like the bottom 10 songs of the top 500. But you know, again, I don't think it deserves to be on the top 500. But I'm not I'm not offended. It's here. Yeah, I'm not offended it's here either, but I'm like I'm with you. I, I would put it on the lower end of the list. Um, I, I will say that the instrumentation in the song is actually really good. Uh, they really do know how to play guitar, and it really does create like a really great sound. Um, and I think the production on this is actually pretty good because the layering of the vocals actually really does create this kind of psychedelic soundscape. But other than that. It's fine. Like the melody doesn't stick out to me at all. There's no part of the song that I immediately remember the the, the singing of. So it's fine. It's good. Brooklyn. The birds still suck. The, the, like they're not. They're not. They're not great. They're not. I. It's they. They really overstayed their welcome uh, with their cover of uh, of Mr. Tambourine Man and. Again, they're kind of doing it with this. Um, the interpretation is really good. Like, like yeah, like like you mentioned, really good guitar work. But this is very much a vibe in terms of like how frantic the how frantic like the back the backing is. But then you have that like very like I just smoked a joint and like let's trippy like that. It's that. It's that. It's, that. it's That's just why it's, it's called it's, Eight Miles High. Uh, exactly. But like I should like I should love this, but I don't. It's just it's shouldn't not you be good. listening to this in your shed? I should be listening yeah. to, listen to this in my shed, but I would still listen to like police or something. To be honest with you, um, yeah. as you guys are talking about oh. it, because uh, yeah. um, if there's a 60 song, if there was a 60 song to put in this spot, I would put "Don't Fear the Reaper" here, and then put Eight Miles High" where it where it was, and thinking like the like the low 300s. Don't, don't, don't fear, fear the Reaper is the better one. Yeah, I, I agree. Actually, actually, don't fear the Reaper is way better. But yeah. Yeah, you I know. That was right. here, and now you just re reopen that wound all over again. Though that's fucking that low. <laughs> all right let's uh let's try to heal coho's wounds uh number 180 walk on the wild side by lou reed uh i'll start with this one because that bass line is iconic yeah. uh i mean we kind of talked about it already when we had kelly Meehan on uh and we talked about the, the tribe called quest song uh can i kick it yes you can um this song i get the cultural significance of it. Uh, I get that, like, during the time it was touching on some subjects that you really don't talk about, um, especially in the opening verse um, when it talks about prostitution and, you know, uh, sex change um, and things like that. Uh, so I, I get the, the atmosphere and the mood that it's going for, and I do really like Lou Reed's vocals on it. Um, I just don't know if I'd put it this high, maybe in the 200s. I think that would be good. I don't know. I really, really like this song a lot. I just don't love it for some reason. Coho. No, I definitely appreciate like the context of the song and like what it did and why it's important, but I... I don't find it particularly fun or like entertaining as a song. Um, I'm also just not like a Lou Reed fan. So it's just like, that's, that's already sort of a hurdle to clear. So I don't know. It's fine. The baseline's cool. I appreciate it for what it did, but I'm not a, not a huge fan of the song. Oh, real quick, before we go into Brooklyn, I do also want to bring up the saxophone. Saxophone in this song is sweet, uh, right. but Brooklyn. Uh, yeah, this is cool. I would have loved to have been around whenever this originally got released because I feel like parents of this, I feel like parents of this era talk to their kids similar to how they talk about The Simpsons, or like, don't watch, don't. I know, I know it looks, I know, I know it looks really enticing, but don't, but don't listen to the song quite yet. As a kid, I love this, I love this for the chorus and like, and like do 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 do. But that, but now like you actually get to understand the lyrics and what this is about. It's really fucking raunchy and. Uh, yeah, it hasn't. I don't know if it's aged like super duper well, but this is of the songs that I think that is going to take a huge dip. It is going to be this one. This one could ease, this one could also like not be on the list next time, and I wouldn't be surprised. Funny enough, you should mention that Brooklyn. Actually, I think this is aged incredibly well. Talking about some of the the topics that it talks about with like transgender and uh, amphetamines and things like that. Um, 
it was actually 223 the last time. It actually jumped up. Oh, wow. So I could see this actually crawling into the top 100 at some point. We'll, fi we'll find out eventually in the future. Uh, number 179, Comfortably Numb by Pink Floyd. Brooklyn, let's have you start off with this one. Uh, yeah, this is my favorite Pink Floyd song. Uh, of of all time uh and i would and this is definitely in my top 50 songs of all of all time uh just an incredible incredible guitar incredible guitar or uh yeah incredible, incredible guitar riff uh david gilmore's performance in this like that made it like hello hello is there anybody in there um just it's just super super like really it's like spacious um and then you get into like the like the pre-chorus and they add in those like very like the very full sounding keys uh, and then how they're able to sort of like layer, like sort of layer on the vocals. Um, I'm going to look up the name, the guy's name, but there's a guy on YouTube who does uh heart guitar, heart guitar covers, and he does a cover a cover of this song. And it's incredible uh, how he's able to kind of get that same vibe, but in like a finger style guitar. Uh, while you're looking that up, um, I'll go next and say, uh, this is also my favorite Pink Floyd song. Um, just, so this song was written after, I, I believe, after he went to the dentist and they gave him too much Novocaine. And that's exactly the mood that this song captures in the instrumentation and the, and the melody and the production and all that. Because there's this, this sense of kind of floating in nothingness uh, that really captured, especially by the, the keys that just progress um, through the chorus and creates this almost almost heavenly atmosphere. Uh, and it really just does capture the title of the song incredibly well. Lyrically, it's, uh, it, it, it just enhances the instrumentation with the, uh, the poetic words and choices that they use. Um, I, I don't really have much to say about this song, except it is my favorite Pink Floyd song and it sounds incredible. Coho. I'm not really a Pink Floyd guy, um, which is kind of crazy to say. Uh, this song's good. I like the wall, like the whole thing. I think it's like obviously like a masterwork, um, and I can appreciate it for that and its part that it plays in that. Um, I think my favorite Pink Floyd song is another brick in the wall, um, sure. part, part two specifically. Uh, but I think the whole thing's good. Um, but yeah, like I I can't begrudge her being here. All right. Uh, so, J sorry, uh, Jamie Dupuy is the guy who does the heart heart guitar cover of this, and without a doubt, the best Shed song. Not even close. Shout out to Jamie Dupuy, or Jamie Dupuy, whatever. Uh, above it, at one seventy eight, is "Bad Guy" by Billie Eilish, and I want to start by saying, "What the fuck is this doing so high?" I'll tell you like, what the fuck is doing so high. Well, you can tell me later because we're definitely saving you for last. Um, I mean, like, I don't. I'm not saying that it doesn't deserve to be on this list because, like, this is actually a really dope pop song, um, and I think that it is good enough to be on the list. It's just like above Ode to Joel and the Sounds of Silence and Comfortably Numb. Uh, and some of the other songs that we've talked about today, uh, it's just a little too soon. But I do really, as I said, I do really like this a lot. The bass line in this song is tight. Uh, and she really does sound fantastic. Like the, Lyrically, I think this song doesn't get enough credit for creating this really interesting character, this villainous turn. Because um, when you think about some of the lyrics... Yeah, they're not like super villainy, twirl my mustache kind of, you know, bad guy things. But when you think about it, yeah, <laughs> some of these like the might seduce your dad type kind of thing. Uh, yup. Yeah. Uh, it's just it's just too soon to be this high, in my opinion. Brooklyn. Uh, the song that I will always go back to when like, comparing like new newer songs that are too high. Uh, this is above California Dreamin', and I still think California Dreamin' is a is a better better song better song than this. I agree with you, and that the rhythm section is fucking dope. Um, and you have the bass line, but I think it's the kick 
afterwards it's just that that constant like it just it it almost like it's anticipating and it, wa- it wants to it wants to go faster uh but but it doesn't um and then this is one of the better this is one of the better examples of what billy was doing vocal wise like the like the, the quote-unquote mumbles and the layers um i think pers- i think personally for up to me i would throw in uh bury a friend uh, that's probably my yeah. favorite Billy Eilish song, just because of like that is. I think that's one of the best horror pop songs ever. Um, but yeah, uh, th- I'd say I'd say next time around it's gonna stay here. It might take a bit of a dip, uh, but I could see it like yeah, like maybe like one ninety or something. I think every time this list comes out, there's like a select few songs that have just come out that are still in the popular conscious. Um, that the next time the list comes out, they're immediately gone. They're just like nowhere to be found. I think this one stays on the list, but it kind of just dips into the 300s. Koho. This is not the best Billie Eilish song, and I'm actually a little offended that this is as high as Billie Eilish is going to get on this list probably yeah. uh, because I think she's made better songs that deserve to be in the top 100 songs ever written. Um, I think Billie Eilish is a musical genius. Um, I think she is the voice of a generation that, the generation that's just under me has been looking for. I think she's incredible. Um, I think her music, her and Phineas, the music they make is next level. It's better than it's it's better than some of the music that like is below it on this list. It's better than the Ode to Billy Joe uh, by a lot. Go go. Uh, this song is. I, is, I agree with you. Uh, this song is good. Um, I dig it. I think the lyricism is great. I think Billy's performance is great. I think people who say she can't sing are on fucking acid. Um, I agree. I think she's a tor- I think she's a terrific vocalist. She's just not doing a traditional vocal performance. She's changing what music sounds like. And if you don't like it, get the fuck out of the way. Uh, but I think that uh, When We All Fall Asleep, Where Do We Go has like six or seven songs that should be in the top 500 songs ever written. Um, Barry a Friend, I think, is the best song on that album. I would put Barry a Friend on here. Um, I think you could also argue... Um, uh, what is that song called? Listen Before I Go. Uh, I think you could put that in the yeah. top 500. I think that song is brilliant. There's a lot of songs you put on here. Um, yeah, uh, I think that this being the representative of that, though, in place of it, is fine. It was obviously the record of the year winner. It was the most popular song. It was the it was the single. Um, so I'm okay with that. Repl- with that being this being the the representative of that album of her career of everything she's contributed and in such a short window of time to music um and i think it deserves to be this high uh especially in that context of being the representative i'd even put it a few spots higher if it's going to represent all of billy eilish i would probably put in the top 150 if you're only gonna put one billy song to represent it all and you pick bad guy i'd put it in the top 150 um the contributions that she and phineas have made to music in the last three years now uh are indescribably important to changing what music is in three years, they have revolutionized what pop music is and has basically saved it and changed it for the better. Um, where, like, from 2016 to 2018, even a little bit of 2019, we were in this really bland sort of everyone sort of not having anything to offer to pop music, and it was really boring. And then within one year, Billie Eilish and Dua Lipa came in and, and saved it and said, you can do whatever the fuck you want and people will listen because they're looking for something. And this is brilliant. I think Billy Eilish is a, is a true, a true genius. And so is Phineas O'Connell. Um, and I think that both uh, deserve to be right here on this list, if not a little bit higher uh, and other songs. I, I, I do think though, if, if we're talking about in it, we're talking about like innovators of pop at the time, I think Bill, I think Billy Eilish started to walk and then Dua Lipa was like, all right, I'm going to take it from here. And here's where we're going to go for the next five. I seasons. disagree. Cause I think Dua Lipa is imitating the past and not, and putting a new spin on the past. Nothing she's doing is truly new. Um, what Dua Lipa is doing is resurrecting and resuscitating trends of the past and making it sound fresh and new. Well, there's no one has ever done what Billie Eilish is doing. See, on here's this, the thing: on this scale, there's never been an artist like Billie Eilish ever. So what she has done has completely changed, not just pop music, music. She's allowing artists to come out and do things that you haven't heard before, and I think that's what's important, and that's what's crazy. Whereas Dua Lipa is is future nostalgia is exactly the name of the album. It's taking sounds you have heard and putting a new spin on it to make it new, but it's not really new. It's kind of new and kind of not. It's great. Don't get me wrong. I love what Dua Lipa is doing. I think it's fantastic. 
But I think Billie Eilish and Dua Lipa are in different conversations of the pop sphere where Dua Lipa is fun and Billie Eilish is innovative. Here's what I, here's what I will say. I think you're kind of correct. Especially when you're talking about like the couple years before Billie Eilish. But what I would say to expand on that is Lord. I think Lord burst onto the scene sure. and then literally everyone went, we have to be like Lord. And nobody could do it as well as her. That's true. And then Billie Eilish came in and was certain enough. But had her complete own unique kind she of was style totally and personality. She's totally different from Lord. There's no similarities. To I her wouldn't say totally is, different. Um, a, a very I, almost 180. Yeah. I would say they are very different. Lord is able to talk about heavy shit, but her music is fun, like very poppy and bright, especially pure heroin. I will say melodrama is very different from everything else Lord has done, and there's a reason that wasn't a hit. Um, and I don't not because I think it's bad, just because it's it's not pop. It's so different from Lord. Um, and I respect the hell out of it. I don't love melodrama, but I I like it enough. I think Lord I love melodrama. Deserves, I think a Lord lot. deserves sure. I think Lord deserves some credit, but I think Billy I I'm saying Lord deserves credit for the early 2010s, where like you have her and Got E and Fun and like Who Save Us Bruno from Mars. the Black Eyed Peas pop of the late 2000s to try yeah. and give us something new. But I think like what I really I wouldn't even say people were trying to copy Lord. Megan Trainer's not trying to copy Lord. Megan Trainer's just bad. Yeah, like, but we also had a lot of people like Alessia Cara come out. And... I didn't even really compare her to Lord either. Uh, Carly Rae Jepsen, I think. Would no, be Carly Rae oh, Jepsen no, 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 predates yeah, no, no, Lord, no, 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 and no. she's different entirely. Yeah, completely different than Lord. But um, Carly Rae was Jepsen that? is still Carly Rae Jepsen is still extremely unique to herself as very bright bubblegum pop that no one can imitate. But we we got a lot of people like Daya. And um, right. remember, okay, sits still look pretty. Fair, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't even compare those to Lord in that sense. They're just doing. Sure, I'd say their foundation comes from Lord, and then they changed entirely what they were. And I wouldn't even call them bad. I just call all of them. I wouldn't call any of them special. I just think they're there, and that's my thing. Is I don't think I think Lord set the groundwork for them, and then those people came out. I think Lord. I don't even think Billy's on the same house foundation that Lord's on. I think Billy literally went off. The blazing trail of pop went three streets over and built her own house entirely, and now pop music's moved to move to that neighborhood to follow her. I disagree. I think Billie Eilish and Phineas kind of took the foundation of Lord, I but disagree. created their own unique art style to it. I don't see any similarities between Billie Eilish and Lord musically, lyrically, thematically, nothing. I think Billie Eilish is is dealing with shit that no one no one in mainstream pop has talked about yet. Oh, there's Kate. Okay, there's one. There's I think there's one name that we're forgetting about. I agree. I agree with you, Coho, and that bit and that Billie Eilish is definitely like she's kind of creating her. She's creating her own her own branch of pop and, and incredible. Um, but you don't get this, I think, without Madonna, not so much, but Lady Gaga especially, and I just give, in like how she's presenting herself. I'll give you credit on that. I'll give you credit that Lady Gaga, Lady Gaga is definitely someone that I would say Billie Eilish would not be here without not because I think musically or anything there's, I think they're very different no. musically. I, but I think but, Lady Gaga, but, but I think Lady Gaga presenting herself as you can be whatever the fuck you want in this business, as long as you sell it. And like, I think that's why Billy even has a platform to be able to be here. So I'll give you that. But I, I, again, if we're talking musical influences, like bar was, I don't think Lord and Billy Eilish are on the same neighborhood of music. I just don't think I disagree. They, like, I but, don't even think they're in the same. I don't even think their DNA is the same ancestry. Like I think Lord and Billie Eilish are entirely different artists. The only the only similarities you can have is that they're both moody. That's like it. And even then, Billie Eilish isn't moody anymore. Okay. Well, neither is. Melodrama was very moody, and that was like her what? Yeah, melodrama album. was, but not her latest album. Uh, but heard, yeah. we're gonna move on because I think we've talked enough Fair. about Billie Eilish. Um, great conversation, but uh, we're almost at the end here uh, with 177 Jump by Van Halen. Uh, this song's dope. I actually really like this song a lot. Uh, it's basically the whole thought of jumping into a hookup or even maybe even a relationship if you wanted. Um, and it does kind of have that exuberance 
in the uh, in the instrumentation, especially that synth line, which I know they were really kind of nervous about, considering it's Van fucking Halen, and you think guitars, which it does have like a great guitar moment, but that synth line is immediately recognizable and just immediately for some reason just gets into your blood and energizes you it's like an energy drink in that sense brooklyn uh first one of the most one of the best 80s like 80s ish songs um i think like like if, when you think about 80s this is one of them um it's interesting uh valley bertinelli uh was it was just on cue uh last week and they were talking about um whenever eddie van halen was coming up for the riff of this and like she was in bed and like you she'd hear him play this riff for hours and hours on end just trying to figure it out um i'm Kind of baffled though that this is overbeat it. Um, lyrically and like message wise, I think I I can understand it. Um, but I but personally for me, I would switch switch them around here. Um, and I think this is the first time that we're seeing Van Halen as well. I think so. Um, I know that Guitar Hero World Tour helped the song out a lot, but Hot for Teacher needs to be on this list. That yeah. is an incredible fucking track as a rock as as a rock group. And co -op. Too high, but this should be on the top 500, I'd say. Probably down in the 500 range. It's fun. I enjoy it. Uh, this is probably my favorite Van Halen song, but then again, I'm not huge into Van Halen. Um, so, uh, I'll, I dig it. Uh, not this high, though. Too high. Understandable. Van Halen's not necessarily for everyone. Uh, however, speaking, talking, of Van Halen. speaking of Van Halen and uh, songs that they totally were like, hey, we're just going to cover this and not do it as well. Uh, you really got me. By the Kinks, uh, Coho. Yeah, it's fine. Oh, I'm not like, like you going to me first on this was kind of a bummer because like I I I'm, I'm not like huge on it either way. I'm like I don't I, again I wouldn't put it above bad guy. I wouldn't put it above beat it. I wouldn't put it above a couple of songs you talked about, but it's fine. It falls in the same camp of a lot of the things that we talked about this episode that I'm like they exist. I can get why someone would put it in the top 500. I wouldn't, but uh, Brooklyn. Uh, this song is mostly here for the for the story story behind it. Uh, he was trying to figure out the sound for the guitar, uh, and he took a knife to an amp and just slashed it, and that's how they got that really like rough that rough rough sort of sound. Um, it's cool. It's like as like as as a rhythm section, it's kind of it's kind of tough because uh, you gotta because you're doing a lot of doing a lot of like slide and slide and move around. Um, it's aged really well, um, but this is this is going to fall down. I would say next time around. Uh, it has fallen. It was number 80 last time the list was out. Um, I freaking love this song, though. And I'll give you the main reason. Power chords. Power chords. Power chords. Uh, yeah, that, that guitar lick is so sweet, and it's just crunchy, and it's just, like, uh, it's great. Um, especially the, the wild guitar solo that you get towards the end, where it, it, you hear, you pretty much hear the string of the guitar, literally like every motion of it as it's uh, as it's swinging around. Um, it's also super short. It doesn't overstay its welcome. It knows to just get in, pump you up, hype you up, and get out. And I think that is a major strength to this song. I think the song is incredible. But with that, that's actually the end of this section of the list. Uh, and so, as we do with every episode, we are each going to pick one song that we think would immediate that we should immediately put into the top 100. Uh, and I played my cards earlier already. I think the sound of silence easily deserves to be in the top 100 songs of all time. It's in my personal top 10. I also do want to shout out "Ode to Billy Joe" though, because that song was real close. Coho. Uh, uh, if I have to pick one from this section of the list, it's "Beat It." Um, I think Beat It's great. It's Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson should have like 75% of the top 100 songs ever written. Uh, so I'll, I'll give it to Michael. Uh, but you know, I could also just be a troll and put bad guy because like I love bad guy. I, it's not even, which is like that ranks pretty low on my Billie Eilish songs ranking because I think it's good, but it's not like her best. If that had been Barry a Friend, I'd have put Barry a Friend through the top 10. But like, I, I think, I think Billie Eilish is terrific. But I think all three of us agree that that's the best song on that album. That's not my favorite. I guess Barry Friend is my favorite, but I wouldn't call it the best. I think Listen Before I Go is the best song she's ever written. Fair. So. And finally, Brooklyn. Um, I came into this 
I'm ready to throw on I can't I can't stand the rain, but the more I think about it, I think comfortably numb has to be in the top 100 com- top 100 conversation. I uh, just it's going to be I think it's just going to be there and it's it has staying power. All right. And with that, uh we are at the end of this episode. Uh Caleb Coho, thank you for coming on. Um we're going to get a lot of hate mail. Uh where do we send again, that to again? Again, at because I'm Boatman, B C U Z underscore I M B O A T M A N. Uh, any hate mail you have for the show at because I'm Bowman on Twitter. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will have a representative answering uh, your tweets and your emails. Yes, and his all name that. is Caleb. He is very scrawny. He loves Albert Brooks. Send him a copy of Defending Your Life, and he will not roast your soul. <laughs> uh, but thank you again for coming on, Brooklyn. We did it. We're we're 13 episodes in now. Uh, 13, we're yeah. almost there. We're yeah, like um, I'm. Like I, we're always we're always talking about how like next 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 song next section is gonna get like better like better and better and better and just like just kind of peek peeking down the road like holy shit like it's gonna be tough to keep these under under an hour and a half. Oh my god! Would you stop looking at the list ahead of time? Like we're, we're uh, supposed to be. Listen, there is a way. There is a way to cheat. Uh, and it's it has been it has been proven. There are there are professional leagues that you can cheat and you can be a star, but that uh. You, I said it before. You were the Sam the Eagle of Canada. We do things the Canadian way here. Like, go. I hate you. I love. What you. is the Canadian way except to say we surrender and not get involved in the conflict? Uh the War of eighteen twelve. Uh, good sir. Uh, the arrogant. Oh <laughs> uh, yes, the War of eighteen twelve. A war which you lost. Good example. Oh, we. Uh, we. The, the White House burned down in that. War. All right, for and all of us, the hundred stones. For Caleb Coho, for Brooklyn Vale, and myself. Keep arguing about the War of 1812 and keep on rocking. I make a music. I make a music. <laughs>